Welcome, everyone, and thanks for spending some time with us today. I'm Tim Erland, Vice President of Product Management at Tripwire, and I am joined with Tom Langford, who is a CISO and also the founder of TL2 Security. How are you today, Tom? Hi, Tim. Yes, very good, thank you. Very good. I'm looking forward to this. Yep, we're both looking forward to this webinar. We've uh, put together slides separately, uh, and then we're going to have some time for discussion of um, overlapping and uh, conflicting points in our slides. So without further ado, we'll move forward. Uh, if you have questions, we will do a Q&A period at the end. So please submit your questions into the chat window. And then at the end of the presentation and discussion, we'll field those questions as well. So moving forward, I get to go first with my five modern skills for modern CISOs. We'll kick things off with the five skills that I've selected for the modern CISO. And sitting at number five, we've got ambition. Um, the reality is that being a CISO is an executive position. And in the past, it, it might not have really been an executive position. In the past, the CISO was perhaps the most senior or most technical uh, information security person or practitioner. And CISO was just really the, the place that you graduated to. But the job has changed. So if you're not interested in being an executive and taking on all of the, the stress and challenges and rewards that come with uh, an executive position, then being a CISO might not be the right position for you. And that's okay. There are lots of ways to excel in cybersecurity without becoming a CISO. So ambition is certainly one of the modern skills uh, that CISOs need in order to be successful today. In the number four position, I've put technical skills or technical chops as I, I put it here. Being a CISO is still at its foundation a technical discipline. Um, Chief Information Security Officer is the executive responsible for information security and that is uh, a, a technical topic. So while CISOs may not need to have their hands on the keyboards as much as they used to, they still need to be able to understand and make decisions about technical topics and often uh, sophisticated and detailed technical topics. Um, it's difficult to defend against attacks that, that you don't understand. So even though you might have a team of really technically skilled people, in order for you to understand what's happening in the environment and in order for you to be able to communicate it in a convincing way, um, you also have to have sufficient technical skills um, to be able to do that. There's another reason that the technical chops are important, however. The evolution of information security is moving towards uh, an era of analytics and machine learning and artificial intelligence, and all of those topics uh, require a certain amount of technical understanding. Um, a good CISO needs to be able to not only understand those topics in order to avoid being sold uh, products that, that might not deliver on their promises, but also to be articulate in explaining them to other people. So while there's no silver bullet for cybersecurity, um, it's important that the CISO be able to, to um, explain how different technologies are valuable and why they help reduce risk. And you can't do that without a technical capability and technical chops. In position number three, I've put empathy, which may seem like a surprising skill for the modern CISO. But one of the biggest changes we've seen in the CISO position over the last decade has been its evolution into a, a, a business role into a role that involves as much about uh, relationships as um, technical skills. And the key to establishing meaningful relationships with your business partners, your peers, uh, your customers, um, and the, the people that you service ultimately, um, the key to that is really around uh, empathy and reaching out to understand the challenges and problems that other folks have. So empathy is really what allows a CISO to effectively connect with those around him or her. Um, and that allows a CISO to effectively internalize what different levels of risk tolerance are present in the organization um, so, and make better decisions about how to implement controls that, that support those levels of risk tolerance. Fundamentally, what I'm really saying is that without empathy, cybersecurity returns to or becomes that department of no. Hand in hand with empathy, you have the skill of communicating. Communication skills are really a fundamental need for the modern CISO. 
Um, the CISO role is really a, a, that of a translator, um, ensuring that protections that are put in place are aligned with the goals of the business. And in order to do that, the CISO has to be able to communicate with both sides of that equation, both the technical controls that get put in place and also the business leaders and business needs that um, define the levels of risk tolerance uh, that are, are, are specific to each organization. So the CISO needs to be able to cross that divide um, and communicate with both sides. And if you don't have communication skills, um, you're unable to do that. And this is not just the assembly of uh, compelling PowerPoint presentations, but also all of the communication skills that aren't uh, a presentation in PowerPoint. This means networking. This means understanding who responds more effectively to an email or a text or a phone call. It means understanding how your, your peers and customers um, want to provide feedback and uh, learn uh, information that you have to present. So when we say communication skills, we often um, start with an image of a PowerPoint, but the reality is that the most effective and important communication skills are often those outside of presenting slides in a room full of people. Finally, in the number one spot for me is the modern skill that I think uh, almost everybody probably expected to show up uh, in this discussion, and that's financial fluency. The modern CISO uh, is as much a business leader as a technical leader, and that has very real implications in terms of their understanding of how a business is run and the finances of that business. But it's, it's more than just understanding. Uh, the modern CISO needs to not only be able to, to participate in those discussions, but also needs to be able to lead discussions on financial topics that are relevant to the business. So more than any other skill, this financial fluency is truly a requirement for the modern CISO to be a, an asset to the business more than just a participant. Um, and when I say financial fluency, I, I chose those words carefully because it's not just about being able to sit in a, a meeting where finance is discussed and understand what's going on. Fluency implies the ability to, to interact in meaningful ways. And so what a CISO brings to that executive table is the ability to understand technical risks, how they apply to the business, and then positively discuss how a business might choose to take risks that would be advantageous in a language that everybody at the table understands. And that's where financial fluency comes in as a, a modern skill for the modern CISO. So with that, those are my five skills that I've selected. And I'm going to hand the presentation off to Tom to talk about the five skills that he selected. OK, thank you. So let's focus right now on knowing the business. And the subtitle here is, you know, otherwise, what is it all for? Uh, and I think that's that's a really important point here, because if we don't understand the business, why are we doing this? Now, I've used this analogy before about the beer. Uh, and the reality is, and what I, what, I, what I mean when I say this is, when, when I say know the beer, it's know your product. So, you know, I often say, um, you know, what can security do to help you sell more beer or more widgets, et cetera? And this is important for me, really, because if you do not know the sole purpose of your business, if you do not know what it is that it's trying to achieve, be that shareholder value, be that, um, you know, increasing um, profits, be that sipping more product or even... Um, you know, saving money, et cetera, for whatever purposes, be it, if you're a charity, et cetera, then you have actually no idea what you're working towards. And that, I think, is, is really important because it, not only does it give you and your team a sense of purpose, but it also allows you to align your services, align your attitudes, and actually deliver product services uh, capabilities that are in complete alignment with the business. And of course, if you do understand and are aligned with your business, then you've got a set of shared goals with, with the business as well. You're not doing security just for security's sake, because that's one of the most dangerous types of security, I can tell you. That's the type of security that will actually inhibit the way a business does. So I'm, I've often been asked about, you know, as a CISO, what is it that you do? And my, my role is not to make the business more secure. You know, I've said it a number of times. I, you know, I keep saying it. It's about 
helping the business achieve its goals. You're there as a partner and, dare I say, as an, an enabler to the business. That sounds very glib, but there are plenty of examples where the services that you provide, the security services you provide, can have a direct impact on the business and on its bottom line. And that's why I really like this quote from Voltaire, which is, you know, when it's a question of money, everybody is of the same religion. And that's so true because actually, if you are of the same religion or have those shared goals, you're actually part of a team, part of a, a clique, part of a tribe of people that is driving towards the same goals. And that can only help you actually achieve more rather than actually feeling like you're in a constant conflict with the people that you're supposed to be helping in the business. Now, here's the one that I know Tim and I are going to have a little bit of a uh, conversation to and fro. He's going to try and make out that, you know, I think all technical uh, skills aren't useful, etc. And he's going to say that you absolutely have to have technical skills. That's not where I'm going. But I do think that we've absolutely moved on and that we're coming up with a new sort of paradigm of what a CISO is. Now, you're probably getting the idea that I like quotes. And I think, I, you know, quotes work really well for me. One, because you can always find a quote that will fit whatever it is you're trying to prove. But two, I think it's a great way of putting across a message uh, in, a, in, a, in a simple way. And this one is very true because, <clears throat> excuse me, because the half-life of a skill has dropped dramatically. Gone are the days when you could start a job at a bank and still be working there 45 years later or 50 years later, collecting a gold carriage crock and uh, a handshake from the regional manager. Today's business has changed dramatically, and the CISO role has to match that. We have to know that we can learn these new skills, and in this case, the business skills, the skills of the business, and that we can keep up with the business in a way that makes sense to them. If we don't, then our skill set our career model is completely shattered if all we're going to do is focus on security. The broader we can become as we become more senior, the better. So this image of the one-size-fits-all CISO is so outdated as a result. The deal is that actually the team, your team, your CISO's team, has to have these skills, and they are the ones that are actually going to have to evolve and understand the half-life of their skills is actually diminishing greatly. You, you cannot be expected to stay on top of every single one of these technologies, every single one of these skills. You can't know the latest tools, the latest pen testing tools, the latest uh, GRC tools. You can't know how necessarily to write the best business continuity program or carry out the best uh, ISO 27001 audit. You have the skills to do it, but it will take you longer, and it is simply not worth your time. It's going to be far too expensive. So to think that actually we as CISOs need to retain and develop this technology or technical skills is, is ridiculous. That is what the team is there to do. You are there to help direct them into the right direction. And that is the only way that we can stay focused as CISOs on the goals of the business by the judicious use of security. That level of focus will not happen if you're constantly trying to learn the old technology over the, sorry, the new technology over the old. You're not trying to, to learn the, the latest tools, the latest products, etc. You're going to have your hands full with actually helping manage a business operate and helping the security team bridge the gap between you sorry, bridge the gap between the security team and the business to allow it to be as effective as possible. And this is what makes a good CISO. Uh, I say here that if you do one thing, do this. It's actually three things, but you can start it with one thing. So here's my obligatory quote. Um, this really comes down to the fact that we need to be there to hire motivated people and inspire them. It's much more difficult to motivate people into any organization. You must actually hire them first and inspire them. It doesn't come down to technical skills in this instance. You can teach them 
the technical skills that they need and inspire them to go and do more. This is what makes a good CISO. This is what makes a good CISO build a good team as well. And the way to inspire people is to do a whole lot of empowerment. You will definitely inspire people if you empower them. If you give them the ability to have control over their own destiny, <clears throat> to actually be able to influence the way they work, influence the way they learn, and influence the way that they can actually benefit the company as a whole. Empowerment is such a strong tool. Now, this might seem that we're pushing away from the CISO side of things, but I would absolutely disagree there and say these are key aspects of any leader, and especially a CISO, one who often finds themselves coming out of a purely technical environment and not normally having to deal with these uh, soft and fluffy issues. Final quote, I promise you, and this is where it's important. This is what it comes down to. If you can delegate in your organization, if you can actually empower and therefore inspire people in your organization, you will find that you are able to actually move far more strategically within the organization and not be constantly encumbered with the day-to-day. -day. This is a great quote, I think, you know, about taking all of these life to learn what not to play. And that is what you need to do as a CISO understand what you should not be doing to allow you to focus on the things that you should. All right, Tom. Uh, at this point, you and I have both had a chance to uh, discuss our five skills that we selected. And there were some that, that we agreed on, more or less, and some where we, we had some disagreement. And the next, sec next section of this webinar is for us to discuss where we agree and disagree. So the first part of that is around what I called uh, financial fluency, and you called know the business. And we both agreed that this general area is important as a skill for the, the modern CISO. Do you think there are, there are areas here where we actually disagree, or um, do you think we're, we're pretty much well aligned on this? I would imagine we're, we're, we're pretty much aligned on this because, you know, financial acuity and knowing the business are, are pretty much aligned. Uh, the one thing that I think may be different is, you know, maybe you know, financial acuity generally in the managing of your infosec budget, et cetera, et cetera. That's, that's very much table stakes for any kind of leadership role. Financial acuity as regards the entire business is an entirely different ballgame. It's, it's the difference between, you know, managing a budget on a spreadsheet and, uh, you know, managing a, you know, global publicly listed uh, company on the stock exchange. It's, it's mm -hmm. entirely uh, different. It has its roots in the same place, but um, you know, I think, you know, as, as I've said before, really it's about understanding the mechanics of the business and what the business is trying to achieve, what its real goals are. And nine times out of 10, they're all gonna be financial. Uh, it's all going to be about shareholder value. Yeah, that's true. One of the things that I, I pointed out um, in my section was the, the difference between, you know, understanding the finances and, and the language I used, financial fluency, um, which was really about not just being able to sit in the room and, you know, understand what's being discussed, but also being able to, to, to lead those discussions or to contribute positively to them. That's the, the idea of, of fluency. Is that something that, that you've experienced yeah. in your role as a, a CISO as well? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think uh, if you if you can't contribute to a to a meeting at that kind of level, uh, you really shouldn't be in the room. In fact, it's probably going to diminish your impact as a as a CISO or as an executive or a uh, you know a C level executive, however you like to, to to pitch it. It's going to diminish your impact in that role quite significantly because it shows uh, a distinct lack of understanding of the fundamentals. So yes, I think that fluency and that ability to contribute is absolutely vital. But it's not easy knowledge to come by, certainly um, given where most of most of us have come from. You know, primarily technical roles. We could we could, you know, run circles around many people in that in that uh, hypothetical meeting room when it comes to technology details. But that's that's no use at that level anymore. 
Uh, it's more about that, uh, as you say, the financial fluency and the knowledge and understanding of the mechanics of the business. Well, we'll, we'll come back to whether or not the, the technical skills are still useful in the in the next section. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but you know, you brought up an, an interesting point, which is around how do you acquire the, the necessary skills? And this is something that I've seen in the industry um, as a challenge, not just in information security, but, but in general, and it may be more pointed in, in InfoSec, which is that there's the, the, the career path to being a CISO doesn't generally include uh, you know, a, a, an intentional education around finance or business or those aspects. And so it becomes a, a situation where you're, you're thrown into the deep end and have to learn how to swim. Is that, do you yeah. think that's an accurate picture? Is that changing, do you think? I, I think it is a very accurate picture. I mean, if we look at, you know, most people who are sitting around that, that uh, conference room table, the, the CFO, the CEO, et cetera, they probably come from business stroke financial backgrounds. You know, the COO probably has a very strong uh, financial background, et cetera. Um, and I think, um, you know, whereas, uh, whereas we don't, and I think it's, it's, um, it, it's very it's very difficult as a result for someone who has spent their time as you know an IT person or possibly even a security person in various companies to actually have um, gained that knowledge through their day to day lives. Whereas you know somebody who has um, started at life as a, an, an accountant or financial controller, etc. They start to have that, again, I use that word fundamental uh, a lot, but they start to have that fundamental understanding of the mechanics of the business from quite early on. You know, they know how to, um, you know, what uh, uh, cash positions are advantageous in certain circumstances and when they're not and things like that. Um, so I think it's, uh, I think it's really, um, it's something that we have to very much focus on as an industry as a core skill that, um, the sort of the more senior of us should be focusing on. I wonder if um, you know that that comment you made about starting with the the understanding of finances in your career. That made me wonder how many CISOs um, you know have an MBA or a you know a, a business degree in their background, and I'm, I'm guessing the percentage is very small. That's been my experience. Yeah, but and maybe in fact, they probably role. gained that later on. They probably gained that 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 particular True. qualification much later on in their in their lives as well. Well, and, and maybe there's a role here for uh, a business degree specifically targeted at, at CISOs or, uh, you know, uh, other technical executives. I don't know if there are enough CISOs to warrant creating that kind of a program, but it, it would be worthwhile to have that opportunity to study business, but from the aspect of, of um, you know, being a CISO. Uh, possibly. I, you know, I... I I'm, I'm, I think I'm going to disagree with you there because actually this is a, a purely a, a business skill. It's a business requirement, not necessarily a security business requirement. I think probably what the challenge is with many uh, MBAs, for instance, is that they assume a certain amount of business knowledge before you even get in there, as opposed mm. to a certain amount of technical knowledge, etc. That's probably one of the, you know, or potentially a barrier to to more of us not doing that sort of thing. It's it's probably, you know, harder for one of us, say, to, to, to even get into the program in the first place. But I think yeah. the actual program itself does need to be focused on business, not the specifics of a, a security or an IT or even HR, for instance, or, or whatever, whatever discipline there is. It should be focusing on, you know, the, 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 uh, the masters of business effectively. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, that's an interesting perspective. So that that makes me think about um, one of the 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 messages I see frequently in the market is around uh, you know security being a, becoming a, a, a contributor to the business, a positive contributor rather than a cost center, and this idea that you know if, if security is done right, it can add to the bottom line rather than than take away from it. But yeah. the the examples. Are, are few and far between. It often stops with that, that marketing message as opposed to being a, um, you know, a real concrete set of examples. So I don't know if you, if you have thoughts or experience around that. If we move beyond just 
you know, how does a security leader understand the business to how does, how can cybersecurity contribute positively to the business? That's an area I think that's, I think, that's pretty interesting to explore. Yeah, and I, I, I think it's about truly embedding security into, into the company, creating it as, or having it as part of the culture rather than just as a work stream or a cost center or whatever. So, you know, I had an experience where, <clears throat> excuse me, where um, I was working with a, a particular client uh, and um, cut a long story short, they told us that the code that we were delivering took you know, upwards of six to seven weeks to even accept because it had to go through multiple levels of testing, et cetera. Uh, it wasn't tested on our end you know, before it went out, security tests, I mean, um, and it would go to various iterations, et cetera, um, uh, before they would accept it, and therefore before we could bill for it. Now, by incorporating a strong... Um, security element within the standard QA process so that that code that was delivered was secure in the first place. We were able to cut that delivery time, that acceptance time, you know, by in half at the very least. And the fundamental part of that is you can then bill more frequently for the code that you release and sooner. You will get your money sooner. You'll be able to fit more work cycles within a particular uh, uh, accounting period because you're taking less time to to sign off and finish on a particular piece of work. So, you know, that's one example whereby truly integrating security into the process or into the the DNA of an of of an organization or a team or whatever we, will result in actual business benefit. And it's that that last connection you made in that sequence of 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 logic that I think is important where you know, I think it's really relatively easy for most technical people to get to, you know, embedding security in the process is more efficient. You produce code that requires yeah. less testing. You can release more frequently. But that connection of why do more frequent releases matter to the business, to the bottom yeah. line of the business, that's that next step that I think is challenging for a, a, someone and with I, a technical background. I think. Absolutely. And I, and I think that's because we purely think or thought in technical terms. Yes, we should test code, etc. My my stance shifted as I as I sort of through my CISO career and I did not see my job as as making the organization more secure. Because if I did that, all I was focusing on was security. My job was to support the business to meet its goals, its visions, its you know uh, uh, it, it's it's um, it creating its shareholder value, um, generating profit, etc., through the use or the judicious use of security. And I think turning that around on itself, reprioritizing what I'm what I'm trying to do as a CISO, is a really important uh, element of this. So I think you and I could continue talking about this topic and agreeing with each other, you know, all day, but. We need to move on to something where we, we have some disagreement, you know, just oh, just yeah. for the entertainment, of, for the audience at least. So um, <laughs> let's put this discussion aside and move on to the, the, the next topic. We both talked in our individual sections about the value and relevance of technical skills to the CISO job. But you and I didn't exactly have the same message here. Uh, my perspective is that this, this remains important. Um, and your perspective is that we've, what we've we've outgrown it at this point is that right I, I think it's i think it's more about that it's it's less it's significantly less important than it ever was before and i think you know based you know just as we were talking about that we have to focus more on the business i think this is really uh, about actually us growing beyond being able to necessarily roll up our sleeves and patch something test something carry out a risk assessment, whatever, and actually start to guide uh, the security team to support the business and act as that, that bridge between security and the business in a far more effective manner. And you can't do that if because of your technical, your, your, your willingness to embrace the technology and you know, stay involved in it, etc. you can't do that because you will never get out of the weeds as a result. Um, you, you know, you don't see the CEO uh, coming down and helping coding. 
in any kind of sizable organization. I mean, obviously startups, slightly different environment, et cetera, but the CEO does not come down and do, do coding or, um, you know, um, start to fix machines on the assembly line or, or whatever, you know, outside of various dubious documentaries on the TV. But, um, you know, what they do is, is focus on the bigger picture. And that, I think, is what we need to be doing far more. And that's why I say the technology skills, per se, are significantly less important. I, I think you may have inadvertently come up with a, uh, a, a great uh, video series to do where you have CISOs, uh, you know, dress up in disguise <laughs> and go be sock analysts for a day. Uh, yeah, exactly. What could possibly go wrong, right? I mean, I tell you, you, you wouldn't want to be the company with me as a sock analyst. <laughs> but uh, you know, to be fair, I, I, I kept thinking on this on this topic about the 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 you know comparing to other executive positions. Like it, it would be ridiculous for you to say that a CFO doesn't need to have uh, you know financial skills in order to be a CFO because they're more about leadership. Um, so there, there's a spectrum. The CFO shouldn't be doing the day to day accounting, but they certainly yeah. still need to pr have those skills in order to to have that particular executive role. But I bet you most CFOs wouldn't even know how to log on to Oracle or SAP in the first place, uh, for instance. They wouldn't know which ledger to draw up. They wouldn't know, um, you know, how to categorize X, Y, and Z. Of course, they need knowledge that, I don't know, books need to balance and there's a, there's a profit and loss and the principles of a profit and loss in the same way that you or I would appreciate, um, you know, we, we can read a vulnerability report and understand, you know, what's good and what's bad, for instance, or the fact that I could look at a, a business continuity program and understand that uh, actually this document is is useless uh, or it's actually a very useful piece of, uh, of information for use when things are, go you know, things are going wrong. What we shouldn't be doing, however, is necessarily staying up with the latest details on ISO 27001 and the latest revision. We shouldn't know, we shouldn't necessarily know how to use the latest, you know, the, the Splunk, uh, how to interrogate Splunk, etc. We shouldn't need to know how to, how to use, you know, um, you know, pen test tools and, you know, what, what, whatever the latest, uh, you know, uh, version, version of malware is out there. We should know it exists and we should be able to get briefings from people from our teams, but actually, is it my job to be on top of the latest piece of of um, you know, of ransomware? Not necessarily. Well, it, except I think it's it, it is the CISO's job to be able to understand those topics when they're they're briefed on them. So what I worry about is that um, by downplaying the the value of those technical skills, you you end up in a position where you know you understand the business. You're a great manager of the team, but your ability to, to fulfill the, the, the actual technical aspects of the job, to stand up in a room and be able to explain why the latest piece of malware is important or not important, um, or to explain, uh, you know, one of the examples I give is the, 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 the evolution of um, analytics towards AI and ML and why that's valuable for security analysis and risk analysis. I, I think if you, if you let go of your technical skills, you end up letting go of what makes you a, you know, um, what 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 is the the IS in CISO as opposed to just yeah, being but, an, another executive. But well, yeah, absolutely, there is an element to that. But I think also, you know, perhaps um, uh, maybe I overread this a little bit. But but I think you know we're not talking about letting go of these skills. I think what we're talking about is deprioritizing them. That's in the same way that, um, you know, to, to go back to the CFO example, of course they know that uh, Sarbanes-Oxley exists. Of course they understand the principles of Sarbanes-Oxley, um, you know, for, uh, and, and, its, and its implications to a business. Are they going to go out and actually, um, you know, carry out Sarbanes-Oxley compliance? Are they going to be able to quote the latest version of, um, what was the one I used to use, uh, uh, Massachusetts 201 CMR 17, not necessarily. They're going to understand the implications of it and they're going to understand that, uh, um, that there is uh, work that needs to be done. They're going to understand what that work is. But actually doing it themselves, it would be one, um, cost 
redundant. I mean, you're paying somebody five times the amount to do something that would probably take them two or three times longer to do. Uh, and so I think the need for these skills to be quite so front and centre is is really, um, you know, over um, overhyped, to be honest with you. And I think, again, it's just, you know, going back to the business conversation, I think, again, it's about actually being taken seriously in the boardroom, in inverted commas. You know, if all you can do is talk about bits and bytes and, you know, TLAs and flashy lights, you know, blinking boxes and all that sort of stuff, you're not going to be taken seriously. If you can take detailed technical uh, reporting and documentation and discuss it in a sensible business approach manner to, to the business, that's a, that's a very different thing. So I, I don't know if it's a if it's a good sign or a bad sign that that we take the the points where we we think we disagree and we we ultimately end up being pretty, pretty close to to agreement. But <laughs> I, I, yeah. I I think you and I are coming at this just from two ends of a spectrum, where I, possibly, your yeah. yeah your experience is that that um, people have overemphasized their technical skills and they 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 get lost in the weeds and they you know I've certainly encountered the the the, the CISO who you know, wants to build their own reports in Splunk, as you said, um, and that, that generally doesn't make them a, you know, a, a great candidate for a, a business leader. But on the no, other it's, hand, it's, it's... I've also encountered the CISO who, who, who isn't, who's given up those technical skills or never had them, and as a consequence, can't make good risk mitigation decisions. I, I think that's the difference. There's a difference between giving up the technical skills versus never having them. I think if you've come through the industry, if you've come through and you have been, I don't know, I'm, again, I'm making this up, as, you know, a SOC analyst, then, you know, a, 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 you know, a level two security engineer and then a, you know, a, a, a security manager and then a director, et cetera. You're, it's not like you're just, you know, emptying your brain of all of your technical knowledge. It's still there, but it, it, it's not going to be your priority. It's not going to be your emphasis. Now, if you never had them in the first place, if they took the head of HR and said, congratulations, you're now the CISO, I would, I would certainly agree that that's going to be potentially problematic, you know, unless that's a, a particularly talented head of HR. But, um, <laughs> but I, th I think it's really important that actually as CISOs, not as a director, not as a, you know, a senior security person, but as a CISO, we focus far more on the business side of things than we do on the technology side of things or the technical aspects of it. That is what a CISO's team is for. Now, if you've got three people in your team and you're a CISO, then it's unavoidable. You're going to have to be. It's, it's, you know, it's a question of scale, etc. And you know, there's also a, a question of the definition of what a CISO is in that case. But you know, certainly if you've got a team of 50, 60, 70 people, that should be plenty enough technical capability to uh, um, to allow you to let go in the first place. You bring up a, an interesting point about um, whether you intended to or not about the career path towards towards being a CISO. Yeah, and I think that's actually a, a very reasonable transition to the the next section that we wanted to talk about. So m most executive positions require a uh, you know sort of a, a cross-functional set of skills. But what we, we were just talking about, or you were just saying, was that um, the path towards a CISO has to include these technical skills. Um, you have to have had them at some point. Um, so does that mean that, that CISOs can only come from inside of information security? Or are there other paths that can still result in, in someone being a, a good CISO? Well, I hope so, because, I, you know, I... I my career in information security started quite late, um, you know, because I was in IT before that. But I, I had been described by previous, you know, managers and peers as having a security mindset. So I think it doesn't necessarily have to, you know, follow that traditional path. And in fact, let's face it, most of us, you know, grey hairs and no hairs who are, you know, CISOs now or, or you know, have been in the recent past, there was no such thing as information security by today's standards, 20, 25 years ago when we first started. It was just you know, IT more than anything and access control lists and um, permissions in NT 3.51, you know. So I think um, uh, the, that, that career path up is, is important. You don't have to be 
exposed to every single technical aspect of security to become a good CISO, but you just need to be you need to be aware of it and you need to be able to to understand it. So, um, so yeah, I think it's there are traditional paths to to the CISO as there are in any any other uh, executive role, but you know there are alternatives as long as you have some kind of exposure to that environment. Well, the the traditional path is is as you described it, which is you started in IT and you have yes. a security mindset or you're good at, at security and you get moved into security and then you get promoted through security to, to ultimately until until you're a CISO. Yes. But I'm, I wouldn't <clears throat> argue that, that that traditional path is the is the path that creates the best CISOs. I think it's the one that we've had by default. And so I think the well, question I'm, I'm really asking is what are the – if you were building a – career development plan that ends with someone being that in that CISO role, what functional uh, departments or skills would you want to rotate them through in order to acquire the best set of skills to be a CISO? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think so. But you know, to your earlier point, <clears throat> excuse me, about uh, you know um, being promoted until you become a CISO just reminds me of the Peter principle of being you know, uh, promoted to the level of your incompetence. And I think that's potentially where we, where we find ourselves, although that's not exclusively to, uh, to the information security environment, of course. But, uh, you know, I think uh, a, a lot of people find themselves in, um, you know, in a position by accident. Uh, they quite simply were the last person standing or, or they weren't quick enough in stepping backwards when, that, you know, when volunteers were asked for. But I well, think that's, that's why we ended up with so many scapegoat CISOs too, you know, who are well, well, yeah. never, never well, and, destined and, to be successful anyway. No, that's right. And that's, that's because also the organizations didn't trust the role and didn't invest in the role and didn't give the role the relevant credence. So the natural response is to, you know, CYA because you know you're going to be blamed anyway. So, um, and you, you're not in a position to do anything about it. But um, but I mean to the to, to the point about the, the the traditional path. I think I I used to think back in my IT days when my my career goal was a CIO. I used to think I had to I had to go to three different sort of functions. You know I had to I had to run a you know a local support a, a, you know a help desk environment. I had to run uh, an enterprise IT environment. You know Oracle. Uh, you know all those enterprise applications, etc. Et uh, and I had to, you know, know about the networking, etc. Um, you know the uh, the networking infrastructure and the networking engineering stuff. And I and I used to think that I needed all three of those um, in order to become a good CIO. Um, now I never became a CIO. I actually became a CISO first, thankfully. But uh, but I think by doing that, you're actually limiting um your your options there and i think also you you uh, uh just because you have experience in inverted commas everything doesn't mean that you are a good ciso um i think so much of being an executive is about leadership is about um you know uh the, the management of a team and the the way you the way you work with the team, the way you motivate them and inspire them, etc. Um, I think that those sorts of skills are often far more important. Um, obviously, the security environment it, it, and exposure is important too. But I think just having that over a number of years is probably all that's required. Uh, so basically, I guess I'm saying that you, you, should, you, you can't really be a good CISO if you, all you've had is five years' experience straight out of university. You know, I think the CISO role is more of a you know 10 to 15 plus years' experience because you will have exposed yourself to a significantly greater amount of uh, uh, of experiences. We, we both talked about the importance of, of communication skills in, in one way or another in our in our sections. And and that yeah. that made me think of something that that sounds almost silly to say, but given the the discussion we're having, seems to make sense. Which is that uh, you know doing a, a rotation you know through a product marketing or a marketing role would have benefit as a CISO. I think actually a lot about the value of of um, understanding communication from a like a marketing perspective when you're in that executive role. But it's not something that anybody would 
would think of as as being a you know a, a step no. on the way to to, to a CISO. Absolutely, and also exposure to the financial side of things, exposure to the legal side of things, the HR side of things, um, the <clears throat> the facility side of things. For instance, you know, etc. Et cetera, et cetera, oh, yeah. However, however broad your organisation is, uh, I, I I completely agree. You know, um, you know, back to our original point about uh, um, you know business experience. You know, those. The, the, the CEOs of today, for instance, you often hear of them starting up in the mailroom and then going to another department and then, you know, moving to another department because they're showing aptitude and can-do attitude and all that sort of stuff. And that's what gives them the broad range of business skills that allows them to uh, uh, to, to excel in uh, in the in the in the organisation in business as a whole. Well, and businesses have learned, especially large organizations, that if they want to produce, uh, you know, successors for their their executive positions, they they have to put together, you know, career paths that rotate them through multiple functions. But I don't I don't see that happening with CISOs, uh, no. not yet anyway. No, uh, no, there I is don't an opportunity think so. and I, and there. I, yeah. yeah, I think so. there is an opportunity, absolutely. But I think again, part of that is is around the you know being taken seriously by the business. You know, the CISO. The CISO is, is still seen, um, and, and not university, obviously, and it is getting better, but it's still seen as the security guy, when actually it should be you know, more like a, a business assurance person, a business assurance role, um, you know, or a business, uh, a, a business risk or part of the business risk function, you know, or, or whatever. I, I mean, I, I, I strongly think that there's time for a, a real sort of reimagining of um, you know of the CISO role to be perfectly honest with you. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think continuous continuous evolution is is you know what what will happen here. Um, but it you know if you're if you're a CISO now, I think there's an an opportunity to look at your team and you know plan for succession. Right, you obviously you know care about the the career development of the people who are who are on your team and and find ways to to have them. Uh, you know, liaise or work with those other functional groups to improve their yeah. skill set, uh, because those other yeah. groups aren't going to pull pull people in yet. I don't think we're there yet. No, that's right. And and in fact, again, that comes back to that first point again about the, you know being part of the business, etc. It's your role um, acting as that bridge between security and the business. It's your role to create those relationships and to, to and to create those opportunities. You know, and also, you know, on, on, to pick up on on your succession plan point, it's absolutely vital as a as a, a CISO that you create a succession plan. Um, one, as you say, gives people you know career paths and goals, etc. But two, it actually shows that you're serious about what what you're doing. Um, your CEO will have a succession plan. Your CFO will as well. And yet, you know, many people I speak to, many CISOs, uh, you know, or, or security leaders. That's the last thing on their mind. All they're worried about is the, you know, the perimeter or, you know, the latest malware or, or stuff like that. Actually, they should be worried about the long-term longevity of the security function through their uh, succession planning and through their their sort of business acuity. Yeah, I mean, it really is an aspect of of business business continuity in a sense that you you understand. Well, yeah. who who who's going to succeed you if something happens to you or if you leave or or whatever yeah yeah isn't it the greatest irony that we just don't have you know we we don't see things like that we 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 want to you know give other people business continuity plans at the kazoo yet we we're, we're not willing to admit that we might be hit by a bus one day yeah that's that's an interesting point so i think <laughs> we've hit just about the end of our time here and mm. um unfortunately because it's been an interesting conversation uh but um We've run out of time, so we're going to move on uh, to the the Q and A portion at this point. So, as I said mm -hmm. uh, at the beginning, um, if you have questions, you can put them in the the chat window or the Q and A window, and we'll take those questions and and answer them as they as they come in. 